Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I wanted to do um, when talking about Origins, this book, which is all about looking into ways that features of our planet, whether that is uh, plate tectonics or atmospheric circulation or where different resources or metal ores are found around the planet, how all of these features of the world we live on have had a huge influence on the course of human history and the rise and fall of different civilizations and empires. I want to pick out just two examples uh, from the book to tell you about this afternoon. The two that I found to be the most uh, inspirational and, and mind-blowing when I was researching and writing this book. So we'll start first uh, with the global wind machine. Oh, so I don't have any equations for you uh, uh, in this talk, but I do have a lot of maps, a whole lot of maps. And the first map we're going to look at here might be slightly confusing at first, because it's a map that I've created not showing you the landscape of the ground, of the continents, but the landscape of the seafloor. So in the blues here, we're looking at the ocean floor of the North Atlantic, and the line running up the left-hand side is basically the scar in the face of the Earth, which is the Mid-Atlantic Rift. This is where the Earth is opening up with plate tectonics to create new crust. Uh, over on the right-hand side, we've got the bulge of Northwest Africa with Europe above it and the Iberian Peninsula, what was to become Spain and Portugal jutting out into the Atlantic. And when we pick up the story in the early 1400s, Europe was backwards. We were uncivilized. We were unadvanced. We were economically poor. We were right on the end, right on the extreme limit of this great wide continent of Eurasia. We're at the end of all of the trade networks draped across the continent, like the Silk Roads, moving silk and spices, but also knowledge and ideas and philosophy and inventions across the continent. And we received all of that last. We were backwards in that respect. And from the early 1400s, when we started trying to look out into the wider world, we couldn't head east, falling back along the route of the Silk Roads, because this period there was a powerful Islamic empire blocking the way. So we had to look in the opposite direction. We had to look west, out into this vast, stormy expanse of the Atlantic, a place that people in their right minds had never ventured out into before. And the stepping stones, the sort of drawing out European navigators, the Portuguese and the Spanish, were a place like the Canary Islands, Madeira, the Azores. These are all basically just the very, very tips of vast underwater mountains, or the Azores are the tops of volcanoes from that mid-Atlantic rift. And the Portuguese started heading down the northwest African coastline, following the way that the direction of the winds and the ocean currents were already taking them. But then to get back home again, they faced a fundamental problem. You can't just turn around and go back the way you came, because you'd be fighting against the very winds and ocean currents that took you there in the first place. And so the solution they hit upon was totally paradoxical at the time, was to get back home, you've got to turn away from the coastline, away from the shore, away from the landmarks you know how to navigate by, and head out into the empty gulf of the ocean until you pick up a different set of winds, a different set of ocean currents. You complete what the Portuguese called a volta do mar, a return of the sea. And when they headed further down the West African coastline, this huge loop through the ocean they had to steer to get back home again took them, took them across the Azores. No human had ever been to those islands before. They were completely and utterly uninhabited. So in this very early beginnings of the Age of Sail, these navigators were first, were first trying to piece together the pattern of winds in different places around the Earth, the pattern of the ocean currents. And we've now pieced together this into the global picture of the way the winds move. Now, if we start in this global picture around the equator, this is where it's very sunny, and that warm air rises to high altitude and then cools and rolls over and descends back down towards the ground. With all that warm rising, area, uh, rising air, you get lots of uh, rainfall, which is why we have all of the main rainforests around the Earth or around the equator. That dry descending air coming back to on, towards the surface is where we find all the major deserts 
around the planet. And then to complete that great circulation current high above our heads, the atmosphere has to blow back across the surface towards the equator. And the atmosphere moving across the equator, sorry, moving across the surface is just what we call the wind. Now, the only other important detail here is that the atmosphere, as the atmosphere is doing these huge vertical circulation currents, the entire planet is rotating beneath its own atmosphere. It gives a sideways deflection to the winds which are blowing back towards the equator called the Coriolis effect. So either side of the equator, you have a wide band of winds which always, always blow towards the west. Those are the trade winds. And then towards the poles where the atmosphere is circulating in the opposite direction, you can get a band of winds that blow the opposite way, the westerlies, to cross an entire ocean and then importantly come back home again, you just have to map where these different bands of winds are, like great conveyor belts wrapped around the planet and just hop back and forth to be blown across the ocean one way and then come back again. And so through the age of sail, these European mariners, these navigators, networked and joined together the continents in a way that had never before been accomplished in human history. The Portuguese found the way, all the way south, around the bottom tip of Africa, before they could head east again to find India and the Spice Islands, the very thing they were trying to reach that whole time. And it turns out that to clear the southern tip of Africa, the only way you can do that, by following the way the winds are blowing, is by steering such a wide loop through the South Atlantic Ocean, you stumble across Brazil. The reason that Brazil speaks uh, Portuguese, whereas the whole rest of South America speaks Spanish, is simply that is the way the wind was blowing. The Spanish found their way across the North Atlantic, with Columbus, of course, explored overland to the Panama uh, Isthmus, that thin sinew of land between the North and South American continents, and then became the very first European eyes in history to see this new ocean on the far side of the New World. They called it the Peaceful Ocean, or the Pacific. And they came to establish the longest range trade route in the history of the Age of Sail, the Manila Galleon Route, spanning across the entire Pacific. They started off uh, in China, picked up lots, lots of trade goods, sailed it north to Japan, where they knew they could pick up the westerly band of winds, which took them the whole way across the Pacific to the Americas, and then they headed back down the coast to Mexico, where they had all their silver mines, and then using the trade winds, came all the way back across the Pacific again. The reason that the Californian coast was so geopolitically significant, the reason that cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Jose were founded in the first place is that it's simply the only place you can get to after crossing the Pacific, following the way that the winds are blowing you. The Portuguese found a shortcut across the Indian Ocean. Um, uh, sorry, the Dutch found the shortcut, cutting out the Portuguese, discovered the continent of Australia in the process, and came to dominate that spice trade by using a band of winds in the southern oceans known as the Roaring Forties. It's where uh, there's effectively a motorway in the ocean. Now, the only trick to using this motion for sailing is you've got to know when to take your turn off, off that motorway. You wouldn't believe the number of ships which wrecked themselves on the coral reefs off the west coast of Australia because they missed an entire continent and plowed into the side of it before turning, hooking left, and turning up towards the Spice Islands. Now, arguably, the most important trade route to the subsequent playing out of human history was the Atlantic Trade Triangle. And this became established in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, when Britain and then the rest of Europe worked out how to get machines to do things for us, to make things for us, to mass produce things like weapons or textiles and clothes, which we sailed down that old Portuguese route to Northwest Africa, sold whatever we had in our ship's holds there, and then instead bought human labor, slaves. We threw into chains into the holds in the ships, took across the Atlantic on the trade winds to the colonies and plantations in North and South America, and those slaves were then forced to work on those plantations to create raw plant products, tea, coffee, sugar, cotton, which then sailed back across the Atlantic on the westerlies, and then we used the machinery we had in Britain to turn that raw cotton fiber 
into textiles and clothing, which we then sailed back down the Portuguese route to Northwest Africa, and so on and so on. This North Atlantic trade triangle was like a huge economic cog, sat right across the North Atlantic, being blown round and round by atmospheric circulation and generating huge profits for its masters. But this entire pattern of European exploration and colonization and empire building, where you build your ports, where you build your cities, was all determined, all dictated by something as simple as the way the wind was blowing, which comes down to the fundamentals of atmospheric circulation around our planet. This was all predetermined in that sense. Now, we not only see the fingerprint of the planetary in history spanning hundreds of years of the age of the sail, you can also see the distinctive fingerprint of the planetary in even politics today, and who people choose to vote for. And one example of this I want to give you comes from this part of the world, which are the southern states of North America. And if I peel off this satellite map and show you the political map, it will perhaps come as no surprise that the southern states of the US are on the whole a Republican voting area. This is a C, a Republican red. But there are Democrat voting counties in this, in this region. And if you look at the map, you'll realize that there's a pattern to the way these counties are choosing to vote Democrats. There's a structure. There's a wide band, a sort of column on the left-hand side, which is either bank uh, of the Mississippi River, so we can kind of understand a geographical process behind that. But what you can also see is this great crescent arcing right across several states in Southwest America, which doesn't correlate to anything you can see in the ground. If we peel off that political map and look at a landscape map, a geographical map, you can see the banks of the Mississippi River on the left, the Appalachian Mountains up in the northeast, but nothing you can see on the ground corresponds to that distinctive feature in the political map. So instead, I'll peel off the uh, geographical map, and I'll show you a geological map. We're going to look at the rocks beneath our feet. And what I'm showing you here are rocks underground that are about 75 million years old. And if I lay back on top of this, the political map, you can see there's an astonishing correlation between people choosing to vote for the Democrats and rocks beneath your feet, which is 75 million years old. Now, clearly, there's no direct link from the rocks to people's political preferences. People aren't digging in their backyard, going, ah, my rocks here are 60 million years old. I'm going to have to vote for Trump. I really wanted to be Democrat, but I have to be a Republican. But what there is, is a long chain of cause and effect stretching through millions of years of Earth's history, of geology and rocks, through hundreds of years of human history. And what's happening here is these rocks laid down 75 million years ago were laid down in a period in Earth's history when the sea levels were much, much higher and lapped right up through continental North America, this great inland sea. And so the rocks laid down in that period basically squashed up seafloor mud that became eroded and exposed on the surface again today along that particular crescent. And it was realized in the mid-1800s, that particular rock type, when it erodes, gives you a wonderfully black, fertile soil, a soil which is perfect for growing cash crops like cotton. And as we already saw, the slaves were brought across the Atlantic on the trade winds and forced to work on plantations specifically focused along that band of rocks. And even today, hundreds of years after the Civil War and emancipation from slavery and the Civil Rights Movement, the greatest concentration of black African-Americans live along that band of rocks, people which unfortunately still today suffer from poor socioeconomic opportunities, people who are much more likely to vote for Democrat election promises rather than Republicans. And in fact, the city that I've pointed out there, Montgomery, was the place where in 1955, a black woman, Rosa Parks, refused to give her seat to a white gentleman on the bus. The entire epicenter of the whole civil rights movement that transformed American society began smack right in the middle of that band of 75 million-year-old rocks. Um, 
I just had time to tell you about two opportunities, two examples from the book. There's a whole load of other stuff about these deep links between the planet we live on and Earth's history, human history. Uh, what was the original Brexit half a million years ago? Why did each of us eat a bowl of cereal or a slice of toast for breakfast? How was the planet determined even what we eat for our meals? Why does the Great Wall of China follow what is ostentatiously an ecological, a climactic boundary, rather than just serving as a defensive barrier? And shamelessly, as an author, I pay my mortgage by doing talks about books. There happen to be, coincidentally, happen to be copies of Origins outside. If you want to pick up, I can sign it for you in the break afterwards. Uh, and as Herb mentioned, my previous book, uh, The Knowledge, How to Rebuild a World from Scratch, is all about the science and technology you would need to reboot civilization after some kind of apocalypse. What would you most want written down as a DIY guide to rebuilding society for yourself if ever someone were to push that big red button in the middle of, uh, of the president's desk? Thank you so much uh, for coming along and listening to me around. Thank you. Thank you, Herb. First of all, thank you. Uh, super fascinating. Um, I noticed that you sort of flipped through a chart that said labor right at the very oh, end Oh, I mean, there. we can skip back to it. You, you now have control. Oh, right, okay. Um, I just wanted to point out, I realized I was running out of time. I didn't want to steal someone else's time, but thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, Southeast uh, US states uh, is not the only place we have this deep link between uh, the planetary and political. Uh, there's a very good example, very close to home as well. Uh, with the labor vote on the left, uh, constituencies tending to vote for the left. Uh, and on the right-hand side is rocks beneath our feet, which just happened to be 320 million years old. And again, this is incredible correlation. Um, do you want to know what the chapter in Earth's history 320 million years ago was? What was that, was that geological period? It was the Carboniferous. And so during the Carboniferous was when all of the great coal fields were laid down in Earth's history, uh, which fueled us through the Industrial Revolution. And the final step in this particular link was that the Labour political party grew out of uh, trade unions and specifically coal mining trade unions. So again, there's this deep link between the planetary and the political, uh, even here in, in Britain. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to catch up on time, but I just one, one other question was, uh, what's your next book? <laughs> the next book uh, exists as a uh, Word document on my laptop, which I was editing on the train up uh, from London this morning. Uh, the publishers are now quite keen to get my corrections back so they can print it. Uh, it is called Being Human, uh, How Our Biology Shaped World History. So looking at intrinsic aspects of us as a species, of us as an animal, and our psychology and our genetics, and how that's had effect on history, rather than how the planet has had an effect on history. So looking at the similar sort of world history, global history, but from a very different point of view sure. of, of us, sure. rather than the, the landscape of the planet. Interesting. Okay. Lewis, thank you so much. Thank you Cheers. so much. Cheers, guys.